Hello everybody, welcome back to Off Meta Musings. I'm your host, Itan, and today we've got another Warhammer World event coverage for you. There was a big old 30-man event that happened over at Warhammer World a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to go through it. We're going to go through all the lists. We are going to look at the standings. We're going to see how everyone did. And yeah, I've got Charles here with me. Say hello, Charles. Hi there. Hello, hello. And without further ado, let's get going. Right, so this is very much like the previous big event that world did they've got two kinds of event really warhammer world they got the weekday events which are kind of the smaller nullwood rumble packs and they've got the big old weekend events as you can kind of see from here it's very similar to the previous weekend event that they did it's built as a hobby event which means that they put equal weighting on how you did during the tournament in terms of your wins your losses that kind of thing and also what some people would call soft scores so things like getting favorite game votes having a nicely painted warband that, that kind of thing so yeah you can see here how they were scoring it you get up to a maximum of 80 points for your tournament victory points i mean 80 84 points technically for your tournament victory points because you get up to 20 quests. yeah you get up to 20 each from your victories plus one each from your tournament quests you can get up to 40 points from favorite game votes this was a four round event so the idea is that every player in the event gets one vote and they get to vote for their favorite opponent that they played during the event and whoever gets that vote gets an extra 10 points and similarly you get another 10 points from favorite warband so again just like the favorite game vote each player gets one vote for whichever one of their opponents warbands they thought was particularly nice well painted maybe it was nicely converted and you'll get an additional 10 points for that so you can get 84 points for your tournament victory points plus another 80 points for your favorite game and warband so that gives a maximum of 164 points that you can possibly get charles we played an event like this before and i mean i thought it was pretty yeah. good I, I quite like the way they're doing it yeah it, it it's one of those ones of it isn't just how well you play the game, it's the be, a, be an actual good player as well. Yes, exactly, exactly. And if you want to look at it, I mean, we're going to look at the scoring in a couple of different ways when we check it out later. If you want to play it as a wholly competitive event and you don't really care about the soft scores, that's fine, you, you do you, really. But you just kind of have to be aware that the kind of event it is encourages you to take, take part in more parts of the hobby than just smashing out a list and winning games realistically you could just have if you wanted just a competitive event you could say yep no painting requirements none of that just turn up mm. with what you want and play yes but then that's not as good an event as when you play an event and everything's nicely like people have brought along nicely converted oh, yeah. or painted sure. warbands and things like that mm, for sure for sure but yeah like i said like the last one i i thoroughly enjoy these events so if you do more games workshop i don't mind this format. I think I think it's pretty good. Moving on to the terrain, it was pretty standard. The Warhammer World Fair, the terrain, so pretty dense. A little fun thing is that this is this is new in the tournament pack. What they wrote, just to talk about the terrain, because last time there were some complaints because we had a number of players who tried to bring like big old terror geists and some of the bigger monsters, big based stuff. And what they found was that the terrain was effectively so dense that they couldn't place their models down. They did that on purpose, really. They like having kind of dense boards that kind of look good to play on, kind of encourages movement a little bit more. And also to, it really is to discourage people from taking those big monsters because according to the organizers themselves, they don't really think that monsters have like they're, they're a bit out of place in Warcry. So instead of just banning them outright, they still do want people to play by the Warcry rules. And if you want to take a monster, you can, but they're telling you now from the outset that it's going to be going to be a bit more bit more difficult you can see it here they're saying it's a rough guide our boards will feature approximately 1.5 boxes worth of terrain on each one so bear this in mind when you're selecting your list so they they're, they're telling you out front this is what it's going to be so don't complain to us when when something happens the other thing with it is as well they're saying the boards are going to be more dense which mm. means you're going to need to focus more on movement yes so yes sometimes taking a a very slow warband or taking no fast, fast elements piece, yeah. yeah can can hurt you yeah now i've heard some things going around the internet the cynic in in people is saying oh you need to run one and a half boxes worth of terrain for warcry so we are intentionally not selling that in the starter sets but you know what to me the starter sets so heart of Gur, under fate all those they are literally starter sets you wouldn't expect to buy a 40k starter set 
with the what, one building enough that terrain, comes with. Yeah, yeah enough terrain to actually arcade. play a real match to play game. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, Warcry is not sold as a board game. Like, absolutely everything you need to play in one box kind of thing. Yeah, so... that's, that's different. Like, Underworlds is a board game and all the pieces come in the box. Yes. Warcry, you get enough in the starter set to start you playing the game. Yes, it's also a very different beast from Kill Team. Kill mm. Team, they kind of designed from the ground up to be this thing that you buy one box and that's the terrain you're going to use and these are the maps and this is this and this is what we're going to do but warcry it's it, it, it's a bit more loose so i think that's that's just where they are with that so what did we actually play so we played the four missions we played no quarter hidden vault reaper and ley lines no quarter just as a reminder you've got to catch table quarters and force your opponents out of table quarters in order to get points hidden vault is you've got three objective markers two of them disappear and the last one is the hidden vault that you have to capture by the end of the game reaper is you got to kill more stuff than your opponent and whoever kills more stuff gets the point at the end of each turn and whoever has more points wins and ley lines is our five objectives one of them starts awakened and then every single turn more of them come online and then each one gives points and then whoever has the most points by the end of the game wins so i think it, it's a good mix of missions here i think what they try to do is kind of balance it so that there's a bit of something for everyone. Charles, you'll be able to, to attest to this. On the Narwood mission pack, it very much is focused on hordes because they have a lot of five and six objective missions. Yeah, um, the, the the Rumble pack is, is very objective focused. Yes. And yeah, it, it plays more to having more models than your opponent just to go and capture more objectives. With the addition of No Quarter and Reaper, in these it really mm. gives a couple of missions that elite armies can kind of sink their teeth into and have yeah, a decent time no play. no quarter is only scored at the end of the game and it's you you hold a quarter if you have a model and the opponent has no model yeah so, so you need to you need you need enough killing power to force people out of quarters exactly yeah. and, i mean it, it's difficult to shift like seven storm cast <laughs> out of anything yeah. especially if yeah you, yeah especially if you're running like soul like grave lords you got like a bunch of skeletons you're not going to kill everything that you need to in order to win no quarter. So I think overall it's it's a bit more balanced. So obviously the elite warbands, you've got no quarter and reaper where they tend to do well in because they've got more killing power in their guys. And then you've got hidden vault and ley lines, which is very much a, if you bring your swarms, you just got to hold these objectives and if yes, you hold them yeah. in the game. Hidden vault is one of those very 50-50 ones mm. though, because it can swing for or against an elite team if the objective goes to the wrong place at the end of the game. Yes, but, but then it's, it's only still, scored it's still at the one end of the game. That, Yeah, it's still one where it's a very 50-50 a between a horde team and an elite team. They picked all of these missions in advance, so yeah. as a selection of missions, I, th I think it's pretty balanced. Yeah, it, it's balanced for most warbands in the game to not have too much of an advantage yeah, on any be, specific mission. You're not going to be crippled by <laughs> taking one build or another. So going on, what did what did we take? So for me, I was using my Hunters of Wanchi. We've seen variants of this list popping around, if you see on the internet. I'm always tinkering with this list. This is the latest version as of two weeks ago. We've got Warhammer Fest coming up. No doubt it'll change between then and now. But the latest version, we've got the Alpha with Moonstone Club, because I need an Alpha, I'm forced to. We've got a Mizzen Master from Kradron Overlords. We have a Skink with Moonstone Club, because he has the Bolus ability, just like the Alpha. We have access to Bladeborn now, so I'm using Sitaka and Otapatil. There we go. We can we can pronounce it correctly. These two guys are from the Starblood Stalkers. Kixitaka is the Skink Wizard, and Otapatil is is the chameleon skink from the stalkers and then we got five one cheese claw this build is kind of built around the mizzen master this time round so the mizzen master has fight for profits now my my issue with the previous build with the achelian king and all the stuff that i was taking there is that outside the king i effectively have no damage at all in the warband and i need some way to boost that because otherwise I'm not going to be winning games like Reaper. I'm not going to be able to sh be shifting guys off of objectives. And it becomes really, really difficult for me to play any kind of game that isn't just a straight capture the objectives game. So I put the Mizzen Master in there. Fight for Profit is the only ability in the game that I know of that boosts the amount of attacks 
that both melee and ranged attack actions can get. Considering my entire warband is all ranged, using something just like even even like a basic onslaught isn't going to work because onslaught only works on melee attacks. But once you've got the Mizzen Master and you start playing around a couple of objectives, you've got things like the Wizard Bolt of a Kixie Attacker, that's 3-6 damage with only two shots, that thing will go up to four shots. And you've got Tawanchi's Claws, they all go up to four shots. Otapatl, his thing goes up to four shots. So suddenly the warband gets a lot of stopping power where you can just well, lay on they they become as good as no fighters yeah they become <laughs> as good as normal fighters but with a range of eight to ten inches and it, it kind of becomes amazing i was doing a lot of testing during this event because i only really get to play during events themselves so there were some plays during the event that i made that i wouldn't make normally if i was playing in a normal event simply because i wanted to test out the mizzen master see how it did so things like keeping it back using fight for profit boosting the attacks of my ranged shooting that that kind of thing instead of maybe being a bit more aggressive with it i think now that i've tested it i would definitely be more aggressive kind of go in there and use fight for profit really just like as a cherry on top as mm. opposed to something to really build the warband around offensively it's got the same punches in the killing king which is which is quite nice but of, of course like defensively it's it's nowhere near as good it's only got 20 wounds it's got the same toughness technically it can get a lot tougher the crowder and overlords have a double which allows it to boost its toughness by one to push it to toughness five which might be interesting maybe if i get into a position that i shouldn't really be in but yeah that's it Over Overall, it's 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 an improvement, I think, from the last version. I've got ideas going into the next version that I'm going to be bringing. But yeah, this is this is solid. It's a, it's a very solid list. And Charles, you're bringing this. This isn't Nurgle. What you're no, it's, it, it's surprisingly it's not Nurgle. No, yeah. We've, well, we were talking about other lists, and we were like, oh, Beasts of Chaos aren't bad. The the best of are, are pretty good, mm. and they're very efficient for a hundred points. They are. So it's got a Dragon Ogre Shagoth, who after we've played the list, we maybe downgrade just to a normal dragon ogre yeah but he's there for his call the lightning ability yeah. which is a triple and it's uh, basically you you roll a two plus on a target within 20 inches that he can see and it does the value of the triple so you you get that triple six and you just point some point somebody a two plus six yep. damage <laughs> Yeah. It, it hurts chaff it, it can does. finish off people it's mm. fantastic and it's cool and like, the, the model's cool so. oh yeah the, the dragon is cool. He's also pretty pretty strong in terms of combat ability. He can take a hit, and it's not it's a movement six, so it's not exactly slow. And it's fast enough. The great break shaman. He's a not bad little wizard with a three six damage, but his main use is the devolve ability, mm. which is a, which you target enemy within six inches. They immediately make a move action equal to the value of the dice directly towards the uh, the Great Breast Shaman. It does give them a fly during the move, so they also ignore terrain, oh. and you can't use it to make people fall to their death. Oh. But it can just be used to make to pull people off of terrain or into range of other other guys in your force. Sure. Which is a really good ability. Hmm. The best of gores, or best gores? They are the best gores. Um, statistically, they are like the best thing you can bring. They're 100 points of... 12 wounds at toughness 4 with a 3 attacks at strength 4 with a 2-4 damage. They were pulling most of the work in the in the list and they can just about take a hit and mm. then still get to hit back. And then just 3 gores of blades just to kind of fill up numbers. So. Sure, because those those 12 wounds on the best of it puts them just above what regular fighters yeah, can put it, out in 2 attacks. It, it, keeps them, it keeps them in just a safe range that they should survive. Yep being attacked twice. So quickly going over the game, well not even going over the game, it's just who we played. My round one, I played against Stormcast in no quarter, so very difficult for me to actually win that because I find it very difficult to kill Stormcast <laughs> with their lots of wounds and their high toughness. My round two, it was Hidden Vault of course versus Destruction Soup. I won that quite handily because I essentially managed to just wait out until the end of the game and pile a lot of skinks onto the the objective which is pretty nice. Round 3 we played Reaper so Soul Blight Grave Lords is what I was playing. We're going to see that list a little bit later. Dead draw Soul Blight Grave Lords if we're playing lots of skeleton spam they don't really have an amazing amount of damage themselves so i managed to win the first two turns he won the last two turns so dead draw and in round four we were playing ley lines and i played against stormcast again and i managed to win that one because that's what my list does <laughs> It wins, yeah, it wins objective missions, yeah. So I played Rot My Creed in the first game. I ended with three people left, so I could only hold three sectors. He still sure. had 
five models on the board out of his starting 10. It was one of those ones where I'd got down to three models in the last turn. I was like, well, I now can't contest one of the sectors. Yeah. You're going to win. I just needed to take out one more person to make it a minor win to him. I, I only took out less than half. So. Sure. But game two was, in fact, completely opposite. I was playing against Stormcast. And Beskor did what Beskor do. So the Beastmen also have a double, which you can use on the first turn, hmm. which lets you make a move up to the value of the dice. So he'd moved one of his guys with the giant hammers hmm. towards one of the objectives. And I was like, well, you know what? I've got to give it a try. So Beskor made a five-inch move over towards him and then hit him twice <laughs> and got five out of six dice as crits. Oh, nice. And just did 20 damage to him and just so, instantly killed the storm storm cast. <laughs> Yeah, and it was like, oh... Okay, that's a, that's one of the six Stormcast dead. And then the next turn, I murdered another two Stormcast. And it's like, oh, okay, this is going completely opposite. So round three, Reaper, I was playing the new Claws of Karnak, who are oh, yes. fantastic. They're fantastic models. And my god, the damage they can put out is quite strong. How did you um, find this? I've got a theory about Claws of Karnak, that if they can build a list that leverages off that double that allows them to activate in, like the Multiple chain activations people. yeah yeah that chain activation was very it's tasty mm. but it's what let him down in the final round okay because he had four models in total left and he chain activated three of them it allowed me to disengage a guy who could have died and because it was reaper that guy suddenly was no longer on the board to be killed mm -hmm. and i then pipped the last round again because he'd already activated three of his guys nice so it's a very double-edged sword. If you can use it for a killing blow, it can be fantastic. But yep. you've just got to be a bit careful. And around four ley lines? And then like, ley lines, it was against Beast Tamers. Untamed uh, Beasts. Untamed Beasts, that's the yep. one. With their really silly cat that should be a monster, that isn't a monster. <laughs> it's not a um, monster. You're, you're, it, you're salty um, about that cat. <laughs> Well, it's, it is a quad ability that he used, mm. which gives it bonus attacks and sure. strength or damage. Damage. Uh, they can they can just put out a huge amount of damage, and I just kind of underestimated in a couple of places. But it ended in a draw, because with Ley Lines, I'd managed to hold more points for the first two turns and built up a bit of a lead. We evened out in turn three, and then it flipped in turn four. He couldn't get it. He was about a half a centimetre away from capturing one of the other right, points. Right, just not enough. If he had got that point, he would have won by one. Sure. Okay. But as it was, it ended up being a, an actual draw, which was a very hard-fought game. But it was a good game. So going on to this, like, like I said, we're going to look at the stats in a couple of different ways here. This is the rankings of players with out any of the soft scores involved, and then we're going to talk about the soft scores and how people did, because they, they kind of tell two stories almost so first place we got alan bevan he took his demons and nurgle so a plague bearer chimera list we're gonna see we're gonna see a bunch of lists coming up he managed to win all four, all four of his games and ash the soul black grave lord player that i played in the third round um, which is a lot of skeletons and an arch regent as his ally me coming in third place with hunters of Huanchi. then we go into some interesting lists kind of in the middle there's a bunch of one box warband stuff with one additional ally so we've got jade obelisk with a mind stealer chaos legionnaires with a centurion spire tyrants with a myrmidon and a very interesting unmade list with double blissful ones that we're we going to talk about and then we've got untamed beast splintered fang one box then some interesting other interesting stuff going on 11th place there was there was a strange rotmeyer creed list with a wither lord two bloated ones on a chimera so that was interesting to see how it went i guess it was influenced by the list that took the previous event which was mm. a chimera a vanguard like a marauder right. And a, and a mind, mind stealer. stealer, yeah. But of course, you can't do that now because the chimera has gone up in points. So I, I guess it was influenced by that, and it's kind of kind of interesting to see to see how that went. There are a couple of destruction soup lists in there, and you can see it in in terms of the variety of lists that are winning. It's only really right at the top. Do you see hyper optimized, like really? I would say super competitive lists. Let's say yeah. let's say the top not top, top third, uh, the top three almost. And the rest of it, you get a lot of one box warbands with one ally. You get 
a lot of just like singular Age of Sigmar warbands, that that kind of thing. So I like it. There's there's a big variety, and I think that that really tells a lot about the state of the game so far in Warcry, how they've managed to get the balance and how it's doing. But even with the the boost in points of the Chimera, only one of the two Chimera lists managed to make it. So it's not something that will be able to just hold an, an entire game by itself. If you can if you can get around it, and the uh, the missions don't really lend to it, it's it's, it's very beatable, I think. Well, uh, that's the difference between the two lists. One is a Chimera plus a horde of guys, of spam, and yeah. the other one is a Chimera and three elite models. Exactly, yeah. And the three elite, don't get me wrong, with the Lord and Bloated Ones, they do a lot of damage, but they don't really but have they the can't speed. Be everywhere. Yeah, they, they can't be everywhere, they don't really have the speed to do what they need to do. So going on, I've got all the three one equivalents here, so this will be things like two major wins and two draws, four major wins, a major minor, you know, that, that kind of thing. Like I said, first place, Alan's Demons of Nurgle. It's got the Chimera, the Sloppy Bar Piper, and all the Plague Bearers, and it won the event overall. It's very typical of what you would see of one of the, arguably the strongest lists in the game at the moment. There's contention whether you want to bring a lot of Plague Bearers, or some people like to put a Nurgling Swarm in there, but realistically, this is this is what you're going to see right at the top, and it, and it won four of its games. Second, we have My Hunters of Huanchi. I went two major wins and two draws, which was which was pretty good for me. I've talked about this list a ton in <laughs> basically yeah. every single video that I do, so I'm not going to go not not going to go into it too in in too much detail. Like I said, though, the Myth and Master, the addition of that, I, th- I think that was a good idea. I kind of like Kixie Taka and Otter Passel. I think they did the job that I brought them for, and of course the claws they can play the keep away game like um like anyone can. Next, we've got Ash's Soulblight Gravelords. You can see it. It's a lot of skeletons. It's a vampire lord, an abhorrent arch regent. Now, the arch regent is in there for its, I think it's a triple. It's basically a plus, a, a movement boost aura for the first turn, and a Verkos Bloodborne just because it's fairly quick. There was the FAQ change that went in to uh, Resurrection. I found playing against it, it was a lot easier to play against, simply because I didn't have to worry about a skeleton or a champion just like popping up somewhere and then getting to attack me. It's kind of just sitting there for a turn. And it kind of can't do anything, and sometimes it's on less than less than full wounds if it's a champion. So I think the FAQ did what it was supposed to do. Again, it got two major wins, two draws, just just like I did. I think it's still a very strong list, but I don't think it's nearly as good as it used to be, especially with that yeah, going it, through. Maybe needs maybe a little bit more punch to it. Is the only thing it could really help. And maybe dropping a couple of skeletons for another stronger model or a fast model the vampire lord arch regent they can hit hard but outside of those you've got like the workless bloodborne which is which is a bit nippy Mm. i don't know if i maybe drop the bloodborne and a skeleton for example and then get like an almost 200 point something or other yeah just another either something with a little bit more punch or a little bit more speed somewhere yeah Exactly. Perhaps you don't. Maybe you don't even need the skeleton champion anymore yeah. because he's not coming back on full wounds. He's only coming back with whatever the wounds are on the dice. So perhaps that's something that wants to be looked at, just just to get a little bit more punch in there. Next, we got another two major wins, two draws. This is the Jade Obelisk. It's one box Jade Obelisk with a Mind Stealer. It's a good list. I think. Yep. Desecrators are just really good. Very efficient. Desecrators are good. The Blue Spare is good. The Priestess is kind of need to you bring have, her. You have to bring it. The faces and... are good. Yeah, I mean, you'd want more desecrators, but you just don't have the points. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The mind stealer, I think, is a good pick for this for this list. Actually, yeah, it does fit this list to help it out with a, a something that's generally a little bit fast, a good, tough, and killing. It's got utility, it's actually. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, Desecrators aren't going to be moving anywhere anytime soon. The Facers have movement four as opposed to move three, so they're a bit more nippy. But, like, that move eight of the Mind Stealer is it's, it's super valuable, if you ask me. Mm. So, going on, we've got Chaos Legionnaires, so the Curiarch, Hornhelm with Mace, two with Axe, Tundor, and the Centaurian Marshal. It's a very common list. I mean, people like to take Chaos Legionnaires with a Centaurian because thematically mm. they, they, they fit together. He went two majors, one minor, and a major loss, so not all that terrible. On this mission pack, it kind of shows, like, it's one of the smaller lists out there. It's only six man, and it kind of shows how a more elite warband can perform when you've got a balanced, balanced pack like this. Going forward, we've got Joel Spire Tyrants. Again, this looks like a one-box warband, simply because we've got the pit for veterans and the pit fighters with all the different kinds of weapons with Myrmidon as its ally. The Myrmidon is a great 
defensive and offensive piece. It's, it's kind of just this wall that you can put somewhere, and it's very difficult to you die. Ignore it. Yeah, yeah. It's got it, it's got high toughness. It's got high damage. It can throw rocks if it needs to, <laughs> which is quite nice. Again, this one's got two majors, one draw, one minor loss, and yeah, it's not the most killy of warbands, but you know what, eight guys. It's balanced. Um, and finally, this is this is the one I was kind of rooting for <laughs> for this for this event is uh, Darren. He brought Unmade, and people say, "Oh, Unmade, they're not that good." But you know what? I think he piloted this very well. It helps where every single model in your warband has nets. It's not exactly a one-box warband because he's got the two blissful ones now blissful ones are really really good they got a ton of damage to them they got speed they got the nets as well so it's like two box unmade you've got the two blissful ones the three awakened ones of pole arms one with flail because it's got the range on it and two ascended ones and this went two majors one minor and one major loss i think the only loss this had was against the chimera list and if i remember that game went on for a while so i didn't yeah. manage to watch any of it but i would guess the fact that every single guy had a net he could like run an awakened one into a chimera go okay you're netted and that's it. So yeah, I, I, I like this list. I, I, I think it went, went pretty well. I said it didn't tell the whole story, just if you look at it from all wins. We did say that this was a hobby event. Hobby. Yeah, exactly. So this is what happens if you add in the rest of the scores, really. So Alan, he still wins it because he won four games and he got two favorite game votes and one favorite warband. I get bumped up from third to second because of my two favorite game votes and one favorite warband. And then we've seen we've seen a lot of the rest of these lists. But well, interestingly, is third is third, um, yeah. So with his five combined five favorite game and warband votes elevates him from I think it was like seventh, seventh or eighth, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that list is here. It's look really good which is why i've got photos yeah. of it so yeah it got two favorite game votes and three favorite warband i think it won the painting competition also if i remember yeah yeah exactly and as a list it's actually not bad we're running iron jaws so we got a war chanter a brute with gore hacker a weird mob shaman Hard boy with choppers and then three brutes. If you were just running iron jaws, normally you wouldn't see this many brutes because they're very expensive. And for the price of two brutes, you can get three hard boys with choppers. The reason why you take brutes or a brute rather in your iron jaws warband is because of the umescent ability. And umescent basically wins objective games for you. Well, it wins low number of objective games for you so for example in hidden vault if you can get a brute onto that one point and then you pop you messing that negates 80 percent of something like a soul black grave lord warband yeah because it's is it models with a lower than it's lower than 15 10, 15 words yeah Exactly. You, do, you just don't count your. You don't count for holding objectives. You have less than fifteen wounds. I think there's only two models in the Soul Black Grave Lords who actually have. Oh, it'll be, it'll be like in that list particularly. The vampire, like the, Dark the, the other, the other two, va yeah, the two vampires, yeah. and maybe the, the Verkos guy, yeah. possibly. Um, and against a lot of other lists, it just like shuts them out almost entirely. Yeah. Their, like hero. Exactly. Yeah, but you really want numbers also to kind of back that up. So I wouldn't take this many brutes. I. Yes, he took this many brutes simply because, you know, you're doing the conversions and you don't want this massive like, 10 man, 12 man Iron Jaws warband that you have to convert and paint up. It did, did fairly well. It got the favorite game votes, got the favorite warband, won the won the painting contest. So I really like it. it, it it's super cool. And then also I want to talk about this one. So this is Sam Sylvaneth. Again, two favorite game, two favorite warband. It came sixth overall in the final standings. It's a very different Sylvaneth army. If you ask me, Charles, you you played Sylvaneth before, so you'd probably yeah. be in a better situation to talk about this than me. I was actually next to him in the final round, mm. and one of the things he was saying with this list was he really wished he'd brought a kind of hunter, yes. just for something with a bit of punch, because mm. the only thing that's really got any damage is the Arch Revenant, and I think one of the characters from the uh, the Underworlds War Band. Other than that, there's there's not a lot of damage in the list. It's got maneuverability, it can mm. teleport across the battlefield, but it just doesn't have a punch when you really need to knock something out. But it plays the movement game amazingly, because mm. almost everyone in the list has either very high movement or the ability to teleport. Yeah, and the guys um, with high movement have fly baked well. in. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. The Revenant, the, the two archers, are, I think, movement 10 or movement 12 with fly. Elsie is movement 5, I think it is. Sure. 4 or 5. 
but they can all have a they all have a double teleport and they literally just can be placed anywhere on the board there are no fighters here who are just fighters to be brought just for the sake of taking fighters they all have an ability or they can all do something and the the, 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 the three bottom ones are from the the war band and they're just better versions of your models of you have you yeah yeah <laughs> like one of them is an archer so you've got a third ranged model it's an interesting war band but like he he was saying like it just maybe a, a kind of hunter just for a bit of punch and something to maybe anchor if he needs to like mm. have it stand on an objective for a turn oh yeah if you're playing hidden vault for example and you manage to get a colonel hunter on there your opponent yeah. has to really think about charging i think something like this would do well in the rumble pack missions as opposed to these ones yeah it'll do it will, again it'll do quite well again i would like to with this kind of list you'd like to get a kind of hunter in there just to mm. even have just a tankier model and then, then you'd be really cutting down on numbers you're trading one thing for another and it's yeah. maybe it'll break the list yeah exactly exactly but yeah but still it was a very pretty list. I, I really liked it. I'm always a fan yeah. of those little punch out leaves <laughs> that people put onto their bases. So that's 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 pretty cool. So yeah, that was it really. This that's kind of where every everyone came. Like I said, it was a 30 player event. And I enjoy it. I, I, I really enjoy that kind of format, how they how they do things. They do make it not just about winning the games. So there's a little kind of a little bit for everyone in there. I don't know your your thoughts on that, Charles. Yeah, it again like I, I do enjoy a straight tournament game, mm. but there are, with how you have so many factions in yes. things like Warcry and, well, most games workshop games, <laughs> a straight tournament game can very much be won or lost on which faction did you bring. Whereas there were a lot of warbands here who were bought because people wanted to play something specific. Yeah. Because um, they're, like, they're their favorite warband the, or they, they look yeah. cool or they do a thing. And they're still, and I think Warcry also has a good kind of balance there is there is some stuff that is unbalanced mm. there's but a lot of the stuff generally is pretty good across the board you can sure you can run a list from almost any faction without worrying too much that oh can it can it win sure i mean if we go back to the, the only real thing here we're back at the chimera and plate bearers so we, we were talking to alan after after the game and he was like oh the chimera is still so good that I wouldn't not bring it if I was going to a competitive event. And so, what would you? Mm. He, I was asked, "Well, what would you do to fix the chimera?" And I said, "I don't think. I think now the chimera is in a decent spot. It's five hundred and fifteen points. Yeah, you could make it six hundred points. I guess maybe that would the, do something to it. Yeah. But I said but the real problem is the plague bearers. Yes, I think that's where we are at the moment. I think plague bearers are too cheap for what they bring to the table. I think they have too many wounds and they do too much spike damage with that one four yeah. on there. But the, their problem is they're only movement three and they're that's why they're so cheap. Yeah, so they, that's the, they have so much downside. Yeah, that's supposed to be the the equaling factor on this. So I said, well, maybe if you bump plague bearers by five points or even 10 points make them 60 points a model they'd still be good yeah. but what that suddenly does is it cuts down the amount of plague bearers you can take so if you're not able to take what is this what three six seven. if you're not able to take seven plague bearers and suddenly you're on five well, plague bearers if, if they were 60 points a piece yeah you'd have to drop two plague bearers yeah and then you'd be on five plague bearers to bile piper and the chimera and I think a, a Chimera, don't, don't get me wrong, against newer players, probably in like maybe in the, the first couple of rounds of an event, it's going to catch people out because not everyone has, they haven't played it before or mm. they don't know how to go up against it or, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Apparently only one person used the actual anti-monster abilities against it sure. and it worked really well because yeah. it's what they're designed for. Exactly. But we don't see monsters enough to really use them. yeah to get that real anti-monster tactics around and you're you're definitely not the, the majority of people aren't list building specifically to come up against monsters and rightly so like you, if you're only going to see one or two of them in an event why why even do it but yeah I, I think once you hit the top tables if you've got your 60 point plague bearers and you're only playing with five of them as opposed to seven suddenly it's a very different game because the chimera list can't out activate you anymore and it doesn't yeah. have the the just the sticking power to stay on objectives because suddenly once those plague bearers start dying that's it all you have is a chimera and he needs to win the game for you but a chimera can't be everywhere that's the thing with the with the plague bearers you can afford to with like two of them just wait as your first actions especially so... in missions like this where on a couple of them the points aren't scored until the end of the game 
So it, it really doesn't matter what you're doing during the game with those plate bearers. You just need to wait by by time until the chimera does what it needs to do. But yeah, I think I think once you start hitting the amount of models in that warband, it suddenly becomes a much easier prospect to to take down, I think. Yeah. And similarly with the Soulblight Grave Lords, if we go back to this, I did say I think it's kind of fine at the moment. You can go 15 man skeletons if you really want to, but then you have absolutely no killing power. I know a lot of people have said, oh, your basic skeleton with spear, if you get two, three of them, they start attacking. Yeah, sure, they can kill you. But I think what will happen once you get to that point where all you're seeing is 14, 15 man uh, grave lord lists is I think you, you're going to see more ranged I think because suddenly what happens is range fighters who can take down a skeleton in one activation become really valuable because they just knock out a skeleton if you've got two three of them that's three skeletons dead that's kind of what I was doing against the soul black grave lords because I could focus fire skeletons down with javelins and suddenly you can close the activation gap really quickly without really taking any damage and then anything that do does get in there in combat and start some starts fighting any real hammer unit of yours can kill a skeleton and it'll it'll stay down and when it comes back it's not really going to do all that much so if you kind of play around having four skeletons come back during a game because realistically that's that's what's going to happen and you kind of do the same old thing where you want to knock out multiple skeletons per turn i think you can really close it and swing out the game on the later turns but yeah that's it really that's that's all that's that's all i've really got to say about this one it was a very very good event i enjoyed it charles i think you enjoyed it as well yeah the, the beastmen were a different a different list they worked quite well exactly we're going to do some more testing with beastmen a bit mm. later on i will be at Warhammer Fest end of the month so that'll be that'll be exciting not end of this month end of next month and yeah that's it so anyone who's going to go there I will see you there I've got a bunch of stuff coming up between now and then but that's it from me so thank you very much for watching uh, that's it from Charles as well if you want to say yeah. goodbye Charles <laughs> goodbye everyone <laughs> there we go and yeah that's it as always if you like this kind of stuff and you like what I'm putting out please don't forget to like and subscribe and let me know if you were if you're at the event let me know how you did if there were any particular plays that you managed to do that you, that you quite liked or if you just like the look of specific warmans that you want to you want to highlight because I've got pictures of all of them and I'll, I'll be happy to put them up but yeah that's it from me and I will see you next time